Do you remember how the main character in Squid Gang, Song Ji Han, or number 456, lost his money betting on horses? Or maybe you've heard the phrase, you bet on the wrong horse before. Well, placing these bets isn't some long dead tradition, but horse racing is a sport that's both alive and thriving in the US. Wagering on horse racing in 2021 reached over $12 billion alone. It's also extremely popular in Australia, and the Melbourne Cup is the largest thoroughbred horse race in the Southern Hemisphere. So you might be asking, what's the harm in it? We spoke about how dangerous this can be for greyhounds and the injuries they can sustain, but horses are meant to run, aren't they? It's just another form of gambling, only you might get to spend your time outside on a beautiful spring or summer day, watching these majestic animals whiz past. As you watch, you might feel like you're taking part in some kind of old world activity sitting on a historical track. In some places, you can even see the horses walk right through the crowd on a path to get to their paddock. As the Saratoga track puts it, it's such a thrill to get to stand so close to actual greatness, to see the sun glimmering off the horse's beautifully maintained coats, to experience their eyes, their musculature, that close and personal is special. And besides the fact that that's just a very extra way to talk about horses, the cheers, the laughs, the picnics, the bright sunshine, what a way to spend the afternoon. There's that adrenaline rush if the horses you choose win, and even if they don't, you can always try your luck again. Or maybe you imagine horse racing to look like one of those classic movies where everyone's all dressed up with the big funny hats and they're about to go to a ball and sipping champagne and you know, all of that. It's one of the oldest sports out there. And at least in concept, it's undergone almost no changes. It's pretty straightforward. The fastest horse wins. The horses themselves are trained for this and supposedly treated like the star athletes they are. Retraining of racehorses based in the UK claims that racehorses live in the horse equivalent of five-star hotel accommodations. They wake up at 5 a.m. to eat, are exercised for a little while, fed again, then rest or nap, have an evening check, eat again, and then go to bed. When they do race, their feeding schedule may change slightly, but they're still closely watched over and cared for. Sure, the daily routine may change slightly depending on the track, the source, or what article you're looking at, but a wide variety of them claim that horses are treated as willing athletic partners, and they're given plenty of one-on-one grooms and delicious treats. So what's the point of me saying this, painting this beautiful, sunshiny, amazing, like image of horse racing? What's the catch? Well, if these horses are so well-trained, then why did Congress step in and pass the Horse Racing Safety and Integrity Act recently? It's rare to see our government agree on anything at all, but they agreed that changes need to be made within this industry. So what is the horse racing industry hiding? Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're discussing horse racing. Before we even get started, I wanna warn you that animal abuse will be a prevalent theme throughout this episode. So if you're not in the place to hear that, please skip this one and I'll see you next time. For those of you still here, let's get straight into it. The questionable actions around racehorses begin from the very start of their lives, from the moment they're bred. The Coalition for the Protection of Racehorses claims that mares don't conceive naturally and give birth in the summer months. Instead, they're bred to give birth as close to August 1st as possible, the universal birthday for thoroughbred horses or the day that determines their age. Basically, if you have a horse that's born on December 1st, 2022 in the Northern Hemisphere, it'll be considered one year old January 1st, 2023, even though we all know that's not the case. That means it's eligible to race the following year in 2024 as if it were two years old. You may not really want to race a horse that young, but you can, and it allows people to get more time for their horses that way. Choosing the date is one thing, but choosing the horses to breed is another. Apparently, only 6% of racehorses earn enough money to actually cover their expenses. So breeding can be a high risk gamble. Just this aspect alone has been controversial for decades. A blood typing program designed to spot false pedigrees was taking off in the US in the 1970s, with one of the members telling the New York Times, most breeding is done in an honest way but the temptation to cheat is great because there's so much money at stake. Now, the fear of getting caught is going to stop a lot of people. At that time, lawsuits for nearly $200,000 had been filed after one plaintiff paid 50 grand for a fashionable in full broodmare. And that was, well, just a regular horse that was worth only under three grand. Her foal was, as the New York Times puts it, worthless artificial insemination, infertility issues, suspected larceny, and ridiculously expensive horses. Like 
a full born from Racehorse Secretariat cost around $400,000 at the time. These were the issues that plagued the industry. But let's say you did manage to somehow afford to get your hands on a thoroughbred foal. It's not as if that ensures victory. What if they lose? What then? Not only have you wasted your money, but what happens to the horse? Just as we saw in the greyhound racing industry, overbreeding is also a massive problem within the horse racing industry. At times, we see horses being bred and bred and bred in the hopes that they'll produce a star racer. And for all those that just weren't good enough, their fates are questionable, at times unknown or death. While this may not be true for everyone, there's no doubt that this mass horse slaughter does exist. In Australia, up to 15,000 foals are bred each year, but only about 30% of those born into racing will actually ever race. Plus, since those horses only race for about three years, but have a lifespan of about 25 to 30, many are killed young. AnimalsAustralia.org puts it simply, animals plus gambling equals a toxic mix. Here in the US, thoroughbreds that don't win races may be discarded or treated like trash. In 2010, Ernie Paragayo, a huge presence in New York thoroughbred racing and breeding, was convicted for starving and neglecting many of the 177 horses in his facility. The Oakland press said that the animals were hundreds of pounds underweight, hadn't been fed in weeks, and were lice or worm infested. Many were given to horse rescue groups to be rehomed. Six were in such bad shape they had to be euthanized. In recent years, there have been proposed solutions, like breeding horses more specifically for durability, so they have longer racing careers and thus longer lives. Unfortunately, this is just a frustrating and sad reality. You might say that these horses are cared for and some retire or are later bred, but horses that leave racing early are literally called wastage. So it's hard to believe that the industry actually, you know, values them in any way. Just a few short years ago in 2019, the United States Department of Agriculture estimated that over 50,000 horses were exported from the US to Mexico for slaughter, despite over 90% of them being in good health. When they're shipped, it's often a brutal journey too, with many horses being kept in crowded trucks without food or water for more than a day. Many are injured, dehydrated, stressed, and can pass away during the journey. The USDA reported that some of these travel injuries include, quote, gouged out eyes and gruesome head injuries, open fractures, broken legs, and severed hooves, trampling and bleeding to death. But hey, at least they had a really cool, luxurious horse spa on racing days to relax, right? Frustratingly enough, PETA has also been reporting on the situation and given their history of over-exaggerating claims of abuse, the industry has been able to use that to dismiss or combat their accusations. So thanks PETA for shooting yourselves and everybody else in the fucking foot. In 2014, they conducted an undercover investigation and accused trainer Steven Asmussen, one of the largest and most successful names in the industry and his top assistant, Scott Blassey of animal abuse. A PETA investigator got a job for the two men and worked with them for four months, recording hours and hours of footage of horses receiving joint injections, painkillers, supplements, and things of that nature. Honestly, while I understand that every industry has a few bad apples and maybe not every track or breeder or racer condones or partakes in these practices, when tens of thousands of healthy horses are vanishing or being slaughtered each year, the industry has a problem. Though a horse that can't make the cut may vanish and a retired racer's fate can be brutal, what about those horses that do race? What happens on the track? Top racers are fussed over like any top athlete. An article from the Oxford Blue, which defends horse racing, says that they're not treated cruelly whatsoever with its author writing, I've never seen a racehorse in 15 years of viewing and attending race days look malnourished, scared, or unwilling to run. This author argues that non-racers or retirees can just enjoy their retired days in a stable, be bred, or used in different equine sports. But as the statistics have shown us, this isn't always the case. Yet even the whole treated like a professional athlete line has come into question. Padded whips are meant to create popping sounds to help a horse focus. They supposedly don't cause pain. However, if you're hitting a horse's stomach again and again and again, or if the unpadded portion of the whip makes contact, then it's not exactly harmless. Professor Paul McGreevy from the University of Sydney School of Veterinary and Science published two studies in 2020 that were based on almost a decade of research. He found that yes, horses do feel similar pain to humans when whipped. They may look sturdier than we are, but their skin thickness and concentration of nerve endings are actually quite similar. 
Basically, if you were spurred on to run as fast as you can and receive numerous strikes to your stomach, even from a padded whip, you wouldn't be too thrilled about it. And neither are these horses. And it's not like the whips are actually even needed. In the UK, apprentice jockeys have whip-free races and there's no statistical safety difference, which is the whole reason that the industry uses them in the first place. The public in Australia supports a ban, so why hasn't it been done yet? There's also the matter of doping or drugging a horse to get them to run faster. Anti-doping regulations are in place, though they differ from state to state in the US, but it's not just a matter of giving a horse an illicit drug or not. A lot of therapeutic substances in day-to-day -day care can fall into a gray area. Strangely enough, one of these drugs frequently abused is called Lasix, which prevents fluid retention and can result in weight loss. Or from time to time, if a horse is injured, they might be given a painkiller. While that's great so the horse doesn't feel pain, it means that they don't know not to run and that they can push themselves on racing day as the drugs allow them to keep going. Obviously, this can really irritate an injury and make it much worse for those doing it. And clearly the horse's safety is not their priority. Now, you may be thinking that the consequences of this are probably minimal. Maybe one or two cheaters give their horses drugs, but the effect can't be that staggering. As it turns out, that doping isn't just an occasional cheat, but in 2020, an entire widespread scheme was uncovered. According to the Washington Post, 27 people from racehorse trainers to veterinarians distributed and received adulterated and misbranded PEDs and secretly administrated these PEDs to racehorses. PEDs being performance enhancing drugs. Some of the horses that were given these PEDs were also some really big names in racing, like Maximum Security, who placed first in the inaugural Saudi Cup and in the 2019 Kentucky Derby before his disqualification from the latter. The man that was seen as the mastermind behind the scam was Jorge Navarro. Over his training career, Navarro's horses earned him about $35 million, with some of these undeserved victories earning him around 1.5 million. Navarro has been on authorities' radar for quite some time now. In 2017, he was fined $10,000 after a video showed that he'd suggested giving a horse illegal substances. And at least two of his horses have even tested positive for cocaine use that year. It's hardly any wonder why one of his horses died of a heart attack at only eight years old. While it could have been a freak accident or a tragedy, my personal opinion is that it likely had something to do with the drug cocktail he's been giving his horses. What I absolutely do not understand is how he was able to keep his horses and race them after they tested positive for fucking cocaine. Like how is that not labeled as straight up animal abuse? When a famous athlete is caught using a performance enhancing drug, it's a shame because they have a choice to not do that and they know better. But these animals are having drugs forced onto them. Yeah, taking the money in a dishonest way is upsetting too, but I'm more infuriated that he was allowed to keep them just because he said the blood samples were contaminated somehow. Like, sure, okay, buddy, some cocaine just happened to walk its way in there and the horse just big old fucking line. But like, I don't know, that was found the same year where you were talking about drugging horses, but whatever you say, buddy. In all seriousness, he paid tens of thousands to buy cocktails of drugs for his horses. And Navarro's supplier, Seth Fishman, had about 2000 other clients too. 265 were in New York alone. Some of these PEDs, like one called red acid, would reduce any inflammation in horse joints, but they weren't approved by the FDA. Again, it really proves that these trainers didn't care about these animals. But as if we needed more proof of that, one trainer was caught talking about Navarro in a phone call, discussing how he secretly disposed of the bodies of horses that died under his care. In the conversation, he allegedly said, quote, "'You know how many fucking horses Navarro fucking killed and broke down that I made disappear? You know how much trouble he could get in if they found out the six horses were killed?' Navarro was later sentenced to five years in prison. And while this was far from the only doping scandal, it was definitely one of the biggest in recent years. What was that phrase from earlier? Animals plus gambling equals a toxic mix. And it really does. But here's the thing, even those that actually do advocate for change and called out the scandal had worrying language, at least in my opinion anyway. For example, Graham Motion, a trainer of the 2011 Kentucky Derby winner stated, Let's face it, it's like any sport. We're no different than any other sport in that respect. The thing is, he's correct in that the horse racing industry is like any other sport because so many sports put their players in harm's way for profit and success. What I disagree with is his tone that treats this as if it was just a mere cheating scandal. This isn't just cheating. This is actively abusing animals for the sake of glory and of course, piles of cash. Unfortunately, the humans in sports can leave while the animals can't consent, can't stop it, and have zero voice in the matter. According to The Atlantic, this happens a lot too. 
Either you partake in it and abuse your horses to win, you labor under a fantasy that the sport is honest, or lastly, you know the industry is crooked, but sit by and do nothing. Because what can you do really? This is just the way it's always been, but it's not the way it always has to be. A fourth option has begun to emerge. The people who know the industry is crooked and want to help. And when we return from this quick commercial break, I just wanna say that we finally have an option that doesn't appear often in corporate casket episodes, some positive change. As summer is winding down and your schedule gets busy, set yourself up for success with the ultimate time and money saving hack, every plate. Every plate's quality ingredients come pre-portioned to help you save money and reduce waste. You know, like the bag of spinach that you have to throw out every week. Or in my case right now, and I know this sounds like a sin, a slice of brie cheese. I know, I know you can yell at me all you want. I love brie cheese. I just can't finish the whole thing. And, and then I just feel really guilty about it. So when your weekdays and nights are jam packed, every plate can help you get delicious meals on the table without breaking the bank. You can choose between 18 recipes that change every week and swap proteins and sides to your liking. So you can switch up your dinner routine however you want. And every plate is the budget-friendly option if you wanna get to home cooking, but you also wanna save some money in your kitchen. With recipes like caramelized onion burgers, Italian sausage gnocchi bake, and sweet Thai chili chicken, it's never been easier to discover that eating well looks good and it's good for your wallet too. So if you wanna get started, get your first box for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code casket149. To get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal on your first box, make sure you go to everyplate.com and enter code casket149. Now, when it comes to running a small business, sometimes it seems like you're just so focused on something that you just forget something right in front of your face. Like trying to open a package with your hands when there's a box cutter like two feet away because Lord knows I'm guilty of that more times than I'd like to admit. But when it comes to running a business, sometimes doing things the hard way means you're just holding yourself back and you're holding your business back. That's where ShipStation comes in because ShipStation gives e-commerce sellers an easier way to manage shipping. So you can take all the energy that goes into managing orders, choosing carriers and printing labels and use it to grow your business. It's no wonder that ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 sellers. ShipStation makes you wonder why you ever did shipping the hard way, because it works with all storefronts, including Amazon, eBay, Etsy, and more, so that you can automate your processes on fulfillment and tracking, and you can save time managing orders and keep customers happy while you focus on what matters, making your business amazing. And you can easily compare carriers, rates, and delivery time, so it's easy to choose the best option for every shipping scenario every single time. ShipStation isn't magic, but it will make your shipping stress pretty much disappear. If you wanna get started, make sure you use promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial today at ShipStation.com and start breathing easier with every shipment. And that's two whole months of stress-free shipping. And of course, it's free to try. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in CASKET. ShipStation, make ship happen. The lack of transparency, standards, and regulation has allowed these bad faith actors within horse racing to thrive. Finally, after more and more scandals rocked the horse racing industry and over 30 horses died at California's Santa Anita Park during a single 2019 season, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act was introduced. It was signed into federal law in 2020, though this wasn't an immediate change. The racetrack safety program went into effect July 1st, 2022, and the anti-doping and medication control program is set to do the same in January, 2023. As we briefly touched upon earlier, different states have different rules for horse racing, anything from medications and what whips can be used and change when you go across state lines. The act claims to change that and enforce a national regulation. Major sports leagues in the US do this. So if someone really believes horse racing is a sport, then this is virtually no different and there really should be no hesitation or issue here. The HISA has stated that 99.8% of races go off without any sort of catastrophic event. Their regulations are simply to prevent those few races and tracks that do have problems. On the other hand, there are those that really doubt that the act is going to do anything at all. And those who insist, the earlier fourth option we mentioned, people who've noticed the problem and want to help, have just kind of been there all along and this isn't really gonna change too much. Sports Illustrated published a lengthy article about this and said that horse racing is viewed very differently when you're actually part of the community. People on the outside see the deaths and are appalled while quote, 
racing views itself as a broad, passionate community of horse lovers who suffer when any horse dies. The trouble here is that premature deaths will happen when you race horses, even if they're actually treated well. Let's take a brief look at what actually happened in Santa Anita. About 20 horses died between December 24th to March 5th at the Santa Anita track. They closed for eight days and reopened in March. Tragically, on the day of reopening, a horse named Princess Lily B took a bad fall and was euthanized. And I'm no vet, but a broken leg for a horse can very often mean the end. So because they have, I guess, a lighter density of bones, and someone can correct me if this is wrong, but I believe they have a lighter density of bones. And so their bones may shatter instead of just break, which makes them near impossible to repair. Although people had complained and questioned the death sooner, Lily B's tragedy put the track right in the spotlight. Much of the news that came out about this track was released after their euthanization. The president of the group that owns the Santa Anita racetrack announced a ban on Lasix, a ban on riding crop whips and ordered transparency in vet records immediately. Lily B's owner said that this was just a tragic accident and trainers at the time actually argued that the rainy winter was the real reason she'd fallen. In June, 2019, it made headlines how only halfway through the year, 29 horses died that season. As CNN puts it, 29 horses dead was actually a good year. And to top it off, they were far from the deadliest track in the US. While a huge variety of scandals led to Hissa's formation, all the deaths in Santa Anita were the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. As the number grew to more than 30, the public justifiably wanted to know why. Why did 30 plus horses die at a single track? Were they being mistreated, getting sick, or being pushed beyond their limits? Well, that's what the media or magazines might leave out. CNN didn't include the why reason behind the deaths. And even in a 2019 town and country article entitled, 34 horses have died at Santa Anita racetrack since December, what happened? That question doesn't have a clear cut answer. Instead, what is clear is that the owner of the track, Belinda Stronach, is from a billionaire family with some pretty gross skeletons in their closet. As in her own father has filed a $400 million mismanagement lawsuit against her. But to just hear repetitive stress injuries and a wet racetrack really isn't enough for the public. Rick Arthur, the equine medical doctor for the California Horse Racing Board puts it this way. You have to put horses first. Part of the problem in horse racing is we have commoditized horses. And when you commoditize horses, you treat them like livestock because they have a value. As one trainer told me, I don't like to leave any money on the table, but the other side of that is not good because that means you want to get the last pound of flesh out of that particular animal. But whether the reason was an unsafe track or something deeper, the point remains the same. The community acted. This was a year before HISA even went into effect. So the argument could be made that the horse racing community knows how to regulate itself. After all, some of the rules California has put in place are allegedly even stricter than what HISA intends to enforce. Those that criticize the organization like the National Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association question how they'd even be funded in the first place. With all the testing they'd require on horses, they would cost about $780,000 per year. And they intend on subtracting this from starter feed. The HBPA claims this will equate to about $1,300 per start, which is about half a horse's earnings at that time. They state, this fee forced onto owners and trainers would result in massive contraction of the sport. Now, aside from the finances, some argue that there are other reasons the HISA just isn't needed. After the incidents, the Santa Anita track even had an about face and started making sure at-risk horses don't race, which would cut into their profits. By doing this, they were intent on proving that they valued horses more than money. There were of course some hiccups, even with the positive changes Santa Anita tried to make on their own, a surveillance camera caught a trainer's assistant giving a horse an illegal milkshake. A milkshake being a substance to elevate their carbon dioxide levels shortly afterward. It's clear that the industry itself can't make all of the doping and the injuries vanish, but long-term there have started to show some positive results. Horse racing deaths have been cut in half in California ever since these crackdowns began. Installing new imaging technologies to catch injuries sooner and requiring trainers to participate in a post-mortem review have been incredibly successful. And once again, this is before HISA was implemented. I'd consider this evidence that the industry can semi-regulate itself without government interference, but this is only in one state and it's only after massive tragedy and backlash. The fact of the matter is that I really do understand where the HISA is coming from. Maybe some tracks do put profits over horses, maybe some don't, but the fundamental issue remains the same. Those within the industry do make excellent points about the changes that they do put in place, while some sort of regulatory body just makes some sense when we look at how questionable and harmful things really have become. 
regardless of how you believe it should be done, one thing is for sure, change is necessary. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I wanna give a big shout out as well to everyone over on patreon.com and especially in the Discord server. You guys have been amazing. If you'd like to join the Patreon, again, patreon.com slash Illuminati. Feel free to check it out. Enjoy some of the perks that we offer. And this very unrelated comment is for the patrons in the Discord server and them alone. Um, That cooking channel that we have now is one of the most dangerous things ever. You guys are cooking up some of the most delicious meals and I, I like have to only look in there at certain times of the day now, but you guys are very talented and I'm very jealous. So with all of that being said, thank you so much for joining for today's episode of The Corporate Casket and I'll see you in the next one.